Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar hosted by USAID's Sustainable Wash Learning Systems Partnership, SWS. Today's speakers will highlight recent learning from Uganda and Kenya about preventive maintenance and how it can help local governments, communities, and the local private sector to shift the paradigm from paying pump mechanics to fix broken pumps to paying them to keep water systems running. And our presenters today are Duncan McNichol with Wave Solutions and Rob Hope with Oxford University. And our moderator today, Ella, will tell you a little bit about more about them in a minute. Our moderator today is Ella Lazarte, who is a water and sanitation advisor in USAID's water office. And before we get started, just a couple of things to know about the webinar platform. You'll note that there's a question box on the lower right of your screen, and you can submit questions at any time during the presentation, but you won't get your questions answered until after we hear from both of them. And if you have any technical issues, um, Grace and Dan on our webinar technical team will do their best to help you out, and we'll monitor the question box for any issues. We do have a, a telephone call in option with this platform, but please note that it is not toll free for international calling. And I also need to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded, as you heard from Dan, and we will be sharing this recording later next week. And you can find slides and other information from today's presentation under the handout section, which you'll see also on the right of your screen. And the recording and related resources from the webinar will be available on globalwaters.org, the USAID Water Sector Knowledge Hub. And I will now turn things over to Ella. Thanks so much, Patricia, for starting us off this morning. Trying to move my slide here. Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, or good evening, depending on where you are. I see that we have over 70 participants. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today on this very important topic on sustainable rural water services, uh, focusing on preventative maintenance models. And I'll be talking briefly about our Sustainable Wash Systems Learning Partnership, uh, or SWS is what you'll hear the most from me, uh, first, uh, and give you a little bit of context. Uh, before we move on to our distinguished speakers uh, today. So bear with me. I know that you joined us for those two and not necessarily for me. Let's see if we can. Oh, there you go. Yep, sorry about that. Trying to move the slide at the moment. Great. So why sustainability? Why are we focusing on this as US aid? Well, it's part of our uh, global water strategy, which we launched in 2017 uh, at the end of it. Uh, and really, US aid's goal under our water and development plan in support of that strategy, which is to increase availability and sustainable management of safe water and sanitation for the underserved and most vulnerable. And also, uh, another reason really is from experience, uh, from us in this room, uh, in this virtual room and, and uh, elsewhere, that despite billions of dollars in investment over decades, the failure rates, if you look at hand pump uh, functionality rates, for example, failure rates are quite high. They continue to be high from 25 to 35, sometimes 40 percent, uh, particularly across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and you'll see that in the literature over and over again. And those are the numbers cited. To us, uh, sustainability is not just putting in the new hardware. It does not equal access to infrastructure. It does not equal, so access to infrastructure does not equal access to sustainable services. The ribbon cutting itself is just part of it, although that's the part that is of most interest to, to many people. So a lot of our work on sustainability is really going beyond that. How do we maintain those services once uh, construction ends? And it's also beyond that, uh, the last point on this, it's really sustainability from USAID's perspective is achieved from our perspective when host country partners and communities take ownership of the development process. And when local systems and networks of actors are in place to deliver those results, to deliver the inputs and resources uh, needed to maintain them and, and really deliver the impact beyond the life of the project uh, when 
when the project finished, usually within a time, five year time frame. And why focus on systems? For us, there's really been a, sh a small shift in our portfolio, particularly in the last few years, towards emphasizing governance, financing, whether it's tracking public expenditures, mobilizing financing, and institutional strengthening. And you will see that in our plans and our strategies. But we wanted to do more. How can we do more with what we have? How can we help inform guidance on sustainability and systems approaches to support countries in achieving the SDGs? And really, how do we work ourselves out of a job in the long run? How do we help countries in their journey to self-reliance? We wanted to look at sustainability differently, and that has really led us to focus on the systems approaches, drawing from the local systems framework uh, published in 2014. We wanted to look at the, so we wanted to capture the dynamic nature of the relationship of the different actors. So actors meaning providers, governments, uh, communities, NGO and the interdependencies and interconnectedness of the different factors, uh, whether the financing, we're talking about tariffs or transfers or taxes, um, institutions. And we wanted to, to see how that works. Uh, it's not a linear process, and it's the key point here is that we need to be adaptive throughout. For additional information on this, I would like to encourage you to look at the water currents uh, that we published on WASH and systems approaches uh, in July 10th uh, to give you a bit more background. And very briefly, what's the SWS approach? Uh, we're trying to understand the system uh, in a more rigorous and systematic way through analysis of actors and factors. And I mentioned what we mean, what we meant by actors and factors before, uh, in terms of the providers, government, uh, communities, and factors could be monitoring, monitoring mechanisms and systems institutional capacity and how do those play out how do they interact uh, and that would help us look at the leverage points where we can intervene we know that we don't have enough money to intervene in every different blockage or, or challenge out there so what are those leverage points that we see based on this analysis and how do we define a set of priorities and so that's the kind of second step if you may call it in in our approach uh, to strengthen the system and how and what do we do to intervene in the system uh, and strengthen the network of actors and factors uh, that we, we've identified. We know that we'll not necessarily get to sustainable services at the end of five years or able to be measure it in such a short time. So we'll be looking at proxy indicators to look at likelihood of sustainability. Adapting, as I said, is a critical component of SWS. And you will see this playing out in the two cases that, that our speakers will talk about today. What's SWS doing? We're testing promising concepts, as many of you in this webinar may remember. This came out of a, a co-creation process with multiple implementing partners uh, about two years ago, uh, this time around. And out of this process, we chose four concepts or activities uh, in different parts of the globe. The focus of today will be in the bottom part. You will see an orange and light blue on preventative maintenance approaches uh, for rural water points in Uganda and maintenance models for small pipe systems in Kenya. And the goal of this, uh, of the SBS Learning Partnership, is really to look at uh, sustainability and test new ideas and approaches and tools to overcome barriers for improving service sustainability and influence USAID to apply evidence on how systems approaches can, can do that and catalyze national and international uptake. We know that sustainability is nothing new to us. It's evolved over time and since the 2000s. Uh, there, there's been some emphasis on post-construction support and professionalization of service providers. And you will hear that a lot in, in, in the next 30 minutes as the speakers talk about it. And, and thinking through how to involve the private sector, uh, what's the role of the national and local level institutions. Uh, we know that community-based management has its challenges. Uh, this webinar doesn't say that it does not work and it should be eliminated. What you will hear is more of a nuanced uh, approach. How do you marry both community involvement, community management, and private sector participation uh, and, and to, in, to ensure rural water supply sustainability? And just uh, a couple more slides. Uh, really what, what we're talking about here is a billion dollar challenge, uh, at least for if when we talk about maintaining Africa to rural water infrastructure. Just in terms of financing alone, if we look at hand pumps, O&M costs are around $500 million a year. 
how are these costs covered? How should these be covered? That's the billion dollar question. Many of us are familiar with resources of financing, taxes, transfers, and tariffs. A lot of the presentations you'll hear really focus on how do we make sure that the tariffs um, are, are, are partly covered at least uh, in, in these models that we're presenting. Uh, usually the infrastructure investment is not the main problem. The key challenge is to pay for ensuring continuity of services once a hand pump is installed or a pipe system is constructed or rehabilitated. And I wanted to give credit to, to Rob for letting me borrow the slide and also to Tim Foster for his tireless efforts in helping us understand this topic better. And uh, I wanted to, to show you just the link here on financial sustainability and on functionality rates uh, going with the theme that uh, if, you look at, if you look at the slide, the rural water point functionality uh, is very much connected with, uh, with the amount of revenue collection that we have um, in, in this. And if we were to achieve uh, the SDGs in Sub-Saharan Africa and rural areas, then financial sustainability must be tackled. And just to show you what's happening right now in, across the continent, uh, in terms of what governments are doing, uh, there's some policy or financing plan that assumes O&M costs uh, are covered by household contributions. I won't go through this, this slide, but just to give you a picture of what's happening, uh, at least in policy, and uh, our two speakers will talk about what's happening in practice. So I'll turn it over to Rob uh, right now. Uh, Rob Hope is from Oxford University, as Patricia mentioned, and he's an associate professor at the School of Geography and Environment and director of water of the water program at the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment. He's a development economist with expertise in water economics and development policy. Over to you, Rob. Hi, Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to say a couple of words um, on this important topic and sort of share some of the work that we've been doing for a number of years in Kenya um, with a number of partners, including UNICEF, trying to understand some of these questions and um, the opportunity to collaborate in the SWS program, looking at sustainability more broadly is, is very welcome. Um, so, Okay, so a couple of words of context about Kenya for those not familiar with um, the country. In terms of the institutional landscape, a lot has changed since 2010 um, for a variety of reasons where decentralization has come in and affected water policy in the country. So you now have um, the transfer of authority and finance to 47 county governments that are mandated to deliver universal drinking water services. So that's a constitutional obligation. Um, and these new county governments were just starting the second term of county governments in Kenya late last year in 2017 have the opportunity to do this. And as a consequence of that, um, the Water Act in Kenya has changed and we've had some collaboration with the government in that process. And the, one of the key aspects of that is that they are now considering not only community management, but also private sector models. Um, so they're looking at a sort of more inclusive approach where previously in Kenya, as many African countries, um, it's been very much community-based management they are responsible solely for the risks and responsibilities of delivering water after the infrastructure is built. And as Ella has mentioned, this has been um, a challenge. There's been variable, uneven um, rates of sustainability. And we're pleased to see in Kenya now that there's um, a more open dialogue to how this is going to go forward. So as, as part of this work, um, some wider context has been um, this issue of payment behaviors and some wider work that um, I've been involved with Tim Foster is sort of looking from the 1980s at multi-decadal rate, rate of payment and what influences that. So we've sort of generated sort of interesting data sets to try and understand what predicts why communities may be paying for it. And some of these issues are around um, systemic issues such as water quality. So if there's poor water quality, it's less likely um, instinctively that people will pay for it. There are seasonality issues, which I think a lot of research is starting to point out now with climate variability and climate extremes that um, during the wet season, people move away from pipe to pump systems moving forward. 
Um, and then there are issues around the distance to water points and productive uses. But these were the only four factors that came out from this analysis. Um, but more broadly, that there's late or non-payment is prevalent. And this, this, is, this is a major challenge um, for Kenya, certainly. Um, there's the, also the wider dialogue about community water management. Is that the community water's choice? And I think what Ella's you know, usefully sort of set out at the start here is how do we rethink the risks and responsibilities between the state, the market, and different users and avoid these sort of binary black and white, it's community-based management or it's PPPs and things. And what, what do we actually need to deliver um, in an effective, sustainable, and equitable manner? Um, to achieve better outcomes for people. And I think there's a lot of interesting thinking going on here that Duncan will talk about in a second as well, which we'd like to um, promote. So as part of the research, I mean, what I'm, what I'm gonna focus on um, for the presentation is, is these ideas of the Fundy Fix model, which has emerged from our work. And these four, um, four domains that we see um, as being quite critical in terms of a systems approach to delivering um, water in, in rural areas. And this includes both hand pumps and pipe systems. It's both for communities and schools and clinics. So what we are attempting to do is a sort of universal model that doesn't selectively pick um, certain types of infrastructural communities. And that, as we all recognize, is quite a challenge. The rationale behind this is scale reduces risk. It's similar to an insurance model, and I can see Richard Carter's on the, one of the attendees, and he's spoken about this many, many years ago. And I think that that logic still applies very strongly in trying to link, link these different dimensions together through professional services, through monitoring innovations, through sustainable finance, and critically from a systems perspective, how do you coordinate this effectively, which I think we all struggle with to a certain degree. So on the professional services front, we have incubated two companies to apply the, this model within Kenya in, in two of the counties. And they've been made quite significant progress in reducing the downtime of piped or pump systems from 30 days or more to less than three days. So it's been, you know, fairly successful at that operational level that if you put in the right systems with good technical support, you can make this happen. We've also looked at various innovations around smart monitoring. Um, so some of the work that we've been doing in Kenny for many years now is, is looking at uh, very simple um, transmitters that you can attach to handles of hand pumps. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see some of the data that emerges. So this is in partnership with UNICEF that you can sort of see hourly or daily rates of consumption. And then in the upper right-hand corner, as you look, that sort of um, slightly messy figure um, illustrates over 2014, the bottom axis shows the amount of water being used across hundreds of hand pumps. And then the top axis in blue is rainfall. And you can see there's a, a close association between higher rainfall events and lo lower use of um, water supply infrastructure. Here it's hand pumps, but that applies also to pipe systems as well. And that becomes important for a lot of our work in terms of using information to try and improve institutional design and performance. Um, there's wider research that we do um, on this type of data looking to um, have condition monitoring so you can predict failures before they happen and other, other elements I can talk to. And then the, the third component is sustainable finance and linked in with the ideas of an insurance model you need some level of fungible um, finance that is available um, to support programs of work. So we have contracts with communities, they're rural, virtually poor communities, as most people in people management, and they're, they're paying on a, on a monthly basis around 10 US dollars is the rate that we arrived at, which I can explain more um, if, if required. Um, now through this, that, doesn't pay the full cost, the full local costs of providing the service or getting us to scale. So there is, there is a financing gap there, which we set up this trust fund as a mechanism to bring together different investors and government into the system to provide a more sustainable platform. Um, and the way in which that works is we're looking to pool financial risks so the users aren't solely responsible for um, fairly um, rare but high high cost failure events 
that they simply can't afford and their system goes down for months, if not is abandoned completely. And the idea of the fund is it, it if, the, if the maintenance service provider is providing high quality services across key performance indicators as such as cost recovery in terms of downtime, um, maintenance services in general, then the fund provides additional resource that they're in a position not to look for money when there's a problem, but to, to provide that um, directly to the companies. And this is the thing that we've been testing um, for, for a while. And this feeds into the collaboration with the Sustainable Wash Systems Learning Partnership in trying to how to understand these systems uh, more clearly. Uh, both through network analysis with, within the county that have a WASH forum that UNICEF set up a number of years ago, how that works and functions and how we understand the different actors within the systems, whether they're government, act, um, NGOs or private sector, how they're working together, where there are challenges within the system and what factors can influence that so we can ideally improve um, the outcomes as we move forward. Some of the initial activities we've done, you know, fairly standard mapping, mapping exercises. So the county didn't really understand what infrastructure it had. Um, and you can see some of that before you and also the sort of operational stasis of, of that infrastructure. And then what we're trying to layer onto this as we go forward is more improved um, local generation of data that allows them to build capacity in maintaining and financing these systems into the future. Okay. And part of this work um, includes WASH Forum activities where we work with the partners and this sort of quite complicated figure you can see before you, which is downloadable from the SWS website, um, talks about some of those factors and actors in, in the, the County WASH Forum. So we looked at a range of factors um, such as building infrastructure, financial sustainability, monitoring, etc., and tried to understand from the 50 odd participants um, that go to these fora, what, what factors they see as being critical in terms of driving sustainability forward. And the initial analysis of this is probably unsurprisingly that they see building infrastructure um, as a key aspect, that's the default model, um, and also issues of reliability. Where there is less support across the different groups, however you disaggregate, this is private sector engagement or monitoring of systems. This is something that is, is, is new and not something that is, is well, um, well accepted. And this is an ongoing dialogue with the county to understand how we, um, how we can collectively think of better systems into the future. This is complemented by um, working one of the one of the eight sub counties in terms of trying to understand user payment behaviors. So why do certain groups of households or communities um, pay for water? What's driving that with our understanding that payment is often contingent on service delivery. If you provide a high quality service, if you have very rapid and effective maintenance systems, preventative or otherwise, that helps communities engage in these systems. But what you can read before you is that there, there is um, a general tendency either not to pay for water or sometimes to have a problem. And that's a critical issue when you're looking at the different blended finance options that people are engaging with at the moment, that if you do not have users paying into this, this becomes um, a sustainability challenge. Just waiting for the slide. Is it gonna, if I click it, is it going to jump? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, it's going to jump. Okay, the next slide talks about um, some technologies that we're trying. These are these FOB-based water ATMs. So um, users um, preload credit onto a card and then they'll get a, um, a volume of water based on that. And they're quite flexible in terms of how you can work them. We're looking with Oxfam and other groups in terms of how they're working, what implications they have in terms of inclusive services, because some of our wider work has indicated that when you have these um, prepayment systems, pay-as-you-go systems, often lower income households tend to defer to unimproved water sources. So that's something that we're looking at very carefully. 
And then some other the other work complementing this is sort of water diaries trying to understand in a very granular sense with a hundred odd households in various countries, including Kenya, how people are choosing different water sources at different times and what's driving that decision making as we go forward. And we see a, a very complex landscape in Kenya. We sort of see rainfall patterns influence the choice um, and source of water over time. And this is ongoing work to help us understand more of the gendered inequalities and the choice preferences for why people are choosing different types of water systems at different times. So I'll, I'll conclude here with a few general co comments. Um, one is around decentralization, which I think in much of Africa and Asia has been um, an interesting um, development in terms of systems-based approaches, particularly in bringing uh, water users or voters close to decision-making authority. And this has opened up new space in terms of water policy and how it's structured. Um, I think there's an appetite to test new rural water delivery models, which is great to see. And there's a lot of really exciting initiatives in West, Central and East Africa and also in Asia, which I think if we can coordinate and understand these more effectively is a great opportunity. And then a key aspect for all of us is understanding how you strengthen local institutions. There's been a lot of work on this over many decades. It's not a simple challenge at all. Um, but what do we need to do to introduce financial sustainability and what are those what are the risks and inequalities in the system in terms of um, the issues of climate as I've mentioned the water quality issue um, and how that affects behavior and also you know poverty in these areas also so I will conclude here and sort of say thanks to my colleague Cliff and Yaga who's helped put a lot of these slides together with the wider team um, and I'll I think I'll hand over to to Duncan. Thanks so much Rob. Uh, let me introduce Duncan so he doesn't have to introduce himself. <laughs> Let's go to Uganda and hear more about the work that Wave has been doing. Uh, but first, thanks to Rob for a data-packed and interesting presentation. It's always good to hear more about what's happening in Kenya, given all of the, the complexities of, of that uh, whole reform process. So our second and final speaker is Duncan McNichol, who's currently the General Manager for Wave Solutions, a Uganda nonprofit social enterprise uh, that provides preventive maintenance, preventative maintenance services for community water sources that serve over 140,000 people. He has a PhD in engineering from Cambridge University, where he studied how stakeholder networks influence institutional development for managing rural water supply. Over to you, Duncan. All right, thanks very much, Ella. And thanks everyone for joining us today, uh, morning or afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, today, as, as soon as uh, the slide loads up here, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work in Uganda, developing a public-private partnership for reliable rural water access. And specifically, I wanna focus on the financial viability aspect of this and focus on our process of experimentation where we're talking about how we have factors and factors with SWS to develop this. And I wanna share a little bit about our experience how do we sort of push on that system to see how it responds and work with our institutional partners and government and elsewhere to see how this system might evolve into a, a viable model that can sustain services. Ella mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that infrastructure isn't necessarily the problem. And this is very much our view with WAVE as well. We're very much focused on the problem of reliable rural water access. We're trying to achieve that 100% functionality. And that means that we don't install new infrastructure. We're very much focused on trying to ensure that what is there continues to function indefinitely. And I think I have a slight lag in my slides here. Right, so there it is, the vision. We're focused on 100% functionality, so much on building new infrastructure. And to do that, as Ella mentioned, WAVE is a Uganda nonprofit social enterprise, and we work very closely with the government of Uganda through a public-private partnership. And this means that WAVE effectively has two roles. The first is being a service provider, where we're managing the maintenance of rural water points. 
But the second is more is broader than that. It's where we're working with these institutional partners, not just to help a company like Wave provide this service, but how do we shape the enabling environment that allows other service providers to come in and function viably to ensure reliable water access. And we I'll talk a little bit more about how we have to manage those two things simultaneously. Overall, this means that WAVE begins its partnership with local government, and we talk about co-developing this vision for how can we create something like 100% functionality for rural water points in a district. And then we work with government on that regulatory environment. How can we set tariffs? How can we ensure communities are signing up for these services? And how can we ensure that companies like WAVE have the legitimacy to operate? Then at the same time, we engage these communities where they sign maintenance agreements for an annual fee. That maintenance agreement is paid in advance, and then it covers all of the monitoring, maintenance, and spare parts for that water source for a year. WAVE then contracts technicians who are members of the Hand Pump Mechanic Association, and then we performance pay them to ensure that sources are maintained before they break or that these technicians respond immediately in the event of a breakdown. And then together, through this joint system strengthening and direct service provision relationship, we can provide rural water supply or reliable water supply. So far, we've been able to do this at some scale. WAVE is currently active in five districts across Uganda, three of which are supported by the SWS Learning Partnership. And we're serving approximately 150,000 people in communities across these five districts. Our function for last quarter was 96%, and we typically hover in the high 90s, which is usually about 10 to 15% above the national average for Uganda. Another metric that we track quite closely is customer satisfaction. We want to see, do people like the service? Are they willing to recommend it to neighbors and other communities? And if not, how can we continue to improve the service so that people are getting something that they value and are willing to pay for? And the service agreements that we have with these communities typically cost between $70 and $125 a year, depending on a few things that I'll talk about a bit later. What I want you to take from this slide is that, at least from the service provision side, We've been able, we, this shows that we can provide a reliable service that people like and that they're willing to pay for. But again, as I mentioned at the beginning about viability, that's only part of the equation. So for WAVE, the real goal is achieving this financial viability. For us, financial viability is a good indicator of sustainability, where we believe if the, syst the system can continue to work when incentives are aligned and costs can be recovered locally. Looking at the incentive structure here, we heard a little bit earlier about the, the status quo of a sort of wait till it breaks mentality. Instead, what if technicians could be motivated to respond before a breakdown? What if communities could be motivated to pay for services in advance and demand quality? And what if governments saw that as a more efficient and effective system and was therefore willing to support it either in kind or more directly, perhaps with some kind of subsidy or cost sharing? Conceptually, our results to date show that this model can work to some extent, but it does all come down to the numbers. And so I want to talk next a little bit about what does it cost to deliver these services. We look at these models quite closely, and a, the biggest expense that we find for recurring maintenance of hand pumps is the hardware itself. And I want to be clear that we, here we're looking at the life cycle cost of the pump. We're considering every component, how long is it supposed to last, what does it cost to replace, and then amortizing this over the over many years so that we can eventually replace every part of the pump as it breaks. And that our estimated cost for that is about $122 a year. And you can read more about that in our recent WEDIC paper, which I believe is also included as one of the handouts. Another unit cost we have is the cost of technicians. We pay them around $50 a year. And, and that's a unit cost. So every new pump that we include in the maintenance program includes those the, that cost of labor and the hardware. We also have an extension cost where we have wash officers that go out to engage communities, renew contracts, and help to explain the, the maintenance model. And then, of course, we have fixed costs, which go down as we achieve some scale. So our total projected cost of maintaining the maintenance for a pump in a given year is approximately $325 if we're just looking at, at the service itself. But you'll recall from earlier in the presentation, I talked about how WAVE has two roles. One is to provide the service, but we have this other component about strengthening the enabling environment. 
And that makes these viability calculations a bit trickier. And the way we conceptualize it is we look at different phases of development of the service model. In the beginning, we have these higher almost activation costs where we have to invest in that enabling environment. We're investing with the support of programs like SWS, investing in those relationships with government to establish that enabling environment, to set tariffs, to set regulation, to do the marketing, to introduce what is quite a new way of working in, in many of these districts where people are paying in advance for reliable services. We also find we have quite a high upfront hardware cost where a lot of the sources that come into the maintenance program have typically been neglected. And so we have to invest upfront quite a bit in initial hardware in order to get pumps to a point where they can be maintained more consistently. And so we divide these phases into this establishing the PPP phase, which can and we believe should be donor funded in order to achieve this, this transformation into a viable service model where then the costs come down to, to those costs that I described earlier to a point where they can be maintained through some combination of local tariffs and support from government. Now you may take a look at this and say, okay, I, I buy the fact that there's activation costs, but what are these costs in the viable services phase? Is it really realistic to expect that these services can be maintained through locally available resources? And what I wanna share with you to answer that question, at least partially, is just some of our numbers from last quarter in two of the districts supported by SWS, just to show how two specific costs that are recurring ones, the cost of labor and the cost of hardware for specific months in the last quarter, how those compare to what we from communities. And what you'll see here is that it's actually quite comparable. I don't want you to look at this and say that WAVE has achieved viability or that we could even be profitable, but I do want to highlight that communities can and are making a re meaningful contribution towards covering the cost of ongoing preventive maintenance. But we're not there yet. And in order to... Oh, sorry, I've just lost power here at home, so I need to need to reset this for a moment. Okay, I think I'm back. Sorry for that. So in order to achieve a financially viable model, we see that there's three things that WAVE needs to keep doing. And these are the experiments that I want to highlight uh, just now. The first is continue a quality service that people value and are willing to pay for. The second is to continue increasing that financial efficiency. How can we recover costs? How can we reduce the amount that we're spending? And how can we increase uh, the revenues that we're receiving? And then thirdly, how can we achieve this at scale? We're not just targeting profitable market segments necessarily. We're really interested in this idea of how do we achieve universal access. And I'll start with the some of the work that we've done and how could we improve the quality of our ser of the services that we're providing. And I'll start with uh, quality spare parts. Rob talked a little bit about the importance of, uh, of how scale reduces risk. And there are other advantages to scale, such as economies of scale. What we've been looking at is how can we work with spare parts suppliers to reduce the cost and improve the quality of the spare parts that we access. And our work with that we found has been quite successful simply because we can aggregate the spare parts needs of hundreds of communities and then use that leverage for negotiating with suppliers. We now have quite a strong relationship with a subsidiary of the pump manufacturer that's based here in Uganda, and they are able to deliver the highest quality parts anywhere in the country with a free delivery, provided that we order up to a certain amount. I think many on this call will be familiar with the challenges of rural uh, spare parts supply chains. And we found that simply by being able to aggregate the need and the risk of working in many communities, we can manage that supply chain quite effectively. Another thing we've been considering is potential for improving the quality of services by upgrading sources. So far, WAVE is focused mostly on rural hand pumps, but we are very much interested in the idea of upgrading these services to something like a, a solar pump scheme. To date, we haven't done it, simply because the, all of the conditions need to be right for us to consider this type of investment. Technically, we can upgrade a source, but we also need the economic, political, legal, environmental, and social conditions for us to justify such an investment. 
we're, consider, we're continuing to vet the sources and opportunities that we have for doing this, but so far, this is a maybe. We're not sure if upgrading pumps to a higher level of service is the best way to go for improving quality and progressing towards viability. A final experiment I want to share on this one is one that failed. We were interested in the idea of improving water quality through shock chlorination, simply dumping some chlorine into pumps that are contaminated uh, on a semi-regular basis. It's inexpensive to do it. The technicians that we have can do this, so it's technically possible. Uh, but we found that it didn't consistently improve the water quality, and you can read more about that in our conference paper that is also included in one of the handouts. The next group of experiments I want to talk about is mostly about our work with government. Uh, one of the places where we have been quite successful is working with that inst institutional structure at sub-county level working with them to establish and pass sub-county resolutions that set things like minimum amounts that households can, should be contributing for things like preventive maintenance, stipulating that communities that want to join the preventive maintenance program need to register as CBOs and open bank accounts. And that's a really, really key part of our development of that regulatory environment that can allow something like WAVE to work. But we continue to work with sub-county government to, to see you know, what that process is and how to put these regulations in place. And so far, that seems to be working quite well in all of the districts where we work. One of the experiments that's still a maybe because we haven't successfully implemented it yet, but we remain interested in, is the idea of pay as you fetch. Rob talked a little bit about these uh, tokens uh, where we can monitor metered revenue collection at the point of source. It, it seems that it's a little bit complicated to implement this for community hand pumps, uh, but at the same time, there may be potential for increasing the amount of revenue that we can generate and implement some type of model like this successfully. But to date, it's, uh, it's still a question mark, and we're continuing to see if that idea fits the particular context where we work. A final one, and perhaps the one I'm most excited about on this slide, is we've been interested in the question of to what extent can government directly support this preventive maintenance? Can they provide materials or financial resources to make up the difference between the cost of providing these services and what communities are currently paying? When I last gave a version of this presentation in April, that was a maybe, we were still in discussions. I was a little bit pessimistic about whether or not that would even happen this year. But I'm happy to report that in May, we received this hardware shipment from the Kamuli District Government, valued at around 2,000 US dollars, where the Water Office assessed the resources that it had, it looked at what WAVE was doing, and it determined that WAVE could do more with this material to further water access in Kamuli District than the District Government. This is still the beginning of, of the relationship uh, with respect to direct resource transfer. So we're still understanding exactly how this works and you know, could this apply in other districts as well. But we think this is a really promising indication of this public-private partnership in action. And we're continuing to, to try and grow this relationship both in this district and elsewhere. And finally, I wanna talk a little bit about achieving scale. Obviously, trying to get to a larger number of communities is important for both reasons of just safe water access and for economic efficiency. And one of the things we've been looking at is how can we reduce the cost of mobilization, the cost of expanding these services that's directly borne by WAVE. What we found is that the hand pump mechanics themselves, the technicians that WAVE contracts, are extremely motivated to expand to new sources because they get paid per source that they're maintaining. And we found that when we're expanding to new areas, mechanics and tell them if they can go around and help to mobilize communities, help these communities to register as community-based organizations or open bank accounts, then that can help them to, these communities to come into the maintenance program faster and then help these mechanics to earn more of a, more of a salary more quickly. That's extremely motivating for them, and we're finding that their motivation to help do some of this mobilizing work can really can go a long way to reducing our, our own costs in engaging the communities and marketing these services. Another question that we're toying with is the idea of saturation. If we're trying to establish a new norm of shifting from a wait till it breaks model to everyone paying for preventive maintenance, what effect does covering all the sources in an area have on that? 
We've been trying to focus in a few sub-counties in some of these districts to achieve what we call saturation, where the majority of these water sources are covered by preventive maintenance agreements with WAVE. But we find that there's a bit of a challenge there where, and from community to community differs. For many of the reasons that Rob described, there can be issues of taste, there can be issues of alternative water sources. So a community with a high need, with a non-functional pump, might be very keen to join the preventive maintenance program. Whereas a community with several alternative sources and feels that their pump doesn't break very often, it might take them even a few years of seeing the maintenance model in action before they'll be ready to join. So we're continuing to toy with this idea to determine how much do we invest in saturating an area versus how much do we invest in just chasing the demand and uh, con continuing to consider the implications of that for how we expand into different areas. Duncan, and one minute. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, I said one minute, Mark. <laughs> okay. I just want to quickly touch on uh, some of the work that we've also been doing with SWS to identify other opportunities for scaling a network of actors from Kamuli districts. And we did this exercise in April. We'll be presenting this back in November to these stakeholders to consider what role is WAVE currently playing in this environment? and what roles are other stakeholders playing, and how can some of these other stakeholders perhaps play a larger role in furthering the preventive maintenance program. I wanted just to quickly highlight this as an example of how we're uh, doing the analysis and then presenting it back to co-evolve what this network is and how it supports preventive maintenance in partnership with these stakeholders. And for next steps, we're going to continue with these experiments to see how close we can get to achieving financial viability. We'll keep expanding in order to achieve economies of scale and in order to expand these services to communities that, that want it. And then through support of programs like SWS, continuing to document these processes. And finally, I just want to touch on a couple of potential implications for others who are listening who are interested in this. We strongly believe that viability is sustainability and to the extent possible, if other programs can be aiming for those cost recovery service models, we think those are quite strong indications of sustainability. And to that extent, public-private partnerships can be a crucial part of that for establishing what a viable model looks like in partnership with institutions that can help service companies like WAVE or others to successfully work in that environment. And then finally, the importance of experimentation. Working with these complex systems isn't just a question of doing the analysis and designing the intervention. We don't necessarily know what works until we try it. And I very much encourage others to, to get out there and push on the system and see how it responds. And sometimes things like this hardware transfer from government materialize much more quickly than we expect because us or our government partners, even we don't necessarily know what's possible until we've done it. And and welcome your questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Duncan, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Always good to hear more about the progress that WAVE is making, uh, especially after a field visit a few months ago. So thank you. We have quite uh, a lot of questions here. So uh, we're now opening the Q&A. We've got 11 minutes. Uh, so let's just dive right in. And please uh, type in your questions if, if more want to ask. Uh, so the first one is for Rob. How were the maintenance service providers selected? Easy question. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ella. Um, the process that we did initially was um, through community engagement. So when we were doing initial diagnostic work, we asked communities which, which mechanics they used and they trusted. And through that process, we identified local people um, to run that. Um, so I should I should clarify as well that these companies are wholly Kenyan owned. You know, Oxford has no role in it other than trying to provide some technical support. Great, thanks. And for Duncan, you mentioned Wave's interest in strengthening the enabling environment. Uh, how are you monitoring your impact on the enabling environment? Tough one. <laughs> And if you want a little bit of time, I can go to Rob. Uh, let me know.
Are you there, Duncan? Maybe not. So let me, I'll go, I'll get back to Duncan in a, in a little bit. So for Rob, are the transmitters used on the remote sensors only for hand pumps or can they be used for other infrastructures such as, such as pipe network? Right, so the, the hand pumps are specifically designed for them, so that's a new technology, um, and other pe people are innovating in this space as well, which is great. Um, for pipe systems, I think there's off-the-shelf um, metering systems that you can use. Some of it can be, you know, smart, smart or traditional systems, um, and some of the colleagues at UCB, Evan Thomas, is working in this space as well. So I think there's a, a range of different technologies, um, and then it's a case of what may be appropriate in different contexts. Great, thanks. Duncan, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Ah, okay, so to the previous question, uh, you, how are you monitoring your impacts on the enabling environment? That's that's a good question. I, I'd say we have two sort of two streams for monitoring. One being just the the direct monitoring of of services where we have our sort of North Star indicators like functionality, payment compliance, and customer satisfaction. And then we're, we're always watching those to see how any intervention, oh, and our, our cost as well, our financial indicators, to see how any intervention affects any of those. And, and so that's sort of our, our guiding light. And then the more subtle things are, they're harder to track with a specific indicator, things like, uh, emergent behaviors by governments or other stakeholders to see what their response is. And we do that through, we, we have these things called storyboards where we basically, on a bi-weekly basis, we track any indications that we see from our partners that indicate a change in their understanding, positive or negative, on their understanding of preventive maintenance. And through that, we're able to capture stories like when government is, say, considering how it might do a direct resource transfer to WAVE. That type of thing, it's, it's very emergent. It's, sometimes it's hard to predict even what that, what that behavior is going to look like until it happens. And so we have a more qualitative monitoring system for that that complements our KPIs. Thanks, Duncan. And that's also one of the things globally that we're trying to do within the Sustainable Law Systems Initiative, so learning partnerships, so watch out for that space uh, in terms of monitoring the and, and progress markers and all of that. So uh, we can tell you more about that in a different uh, webinar in the future. Uh, for Rob this time, for the insurance model uh, of financing, uh, for, for the insurance model for financing, how do you develop cost and risk estimates for different communities? That's a great question. Um, we, through the, the data log is the census that we have on hand pumps, we are able to provide an estimation of um, the volume of water used. It's not precise, I mean, it's plus or minus 10%, but it gives you a proxy for how people um, are using the system. And that provides the basis that we um, then blend with some of the socioeconomic work, either qualitatively or quantitatively, what we think may be an affordable tariff to start. And not dissimilar to, to Duncan and the sort of Rondinelli work, if you want to go back to that, is that, you know, the, these things are sort of um, experimental as you move forward. So setting too high a tariff may restrict people coming into it. And as Duncan sort of mentioned, you, you do have the opportunity to increase that. But what you want to see is people signing up to this as you move forward and working with the regulator, the water service regulator in Kenya that is... Um, um, the institute has institutional responsibility for tariff design, so we work with them on that side of things as well. So it's it's um, you know it's a mixture of sort of um, qualitative and quantitative approaches, and also some um, uh, equity provision in terms of we offer um, quite reduced um, tariffs for schools. Um, to bring them into the system as well, which we then monitor with the, the ministry to try and see how we can improve that as we go forward. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so one more for Duncan. Uh, you quote a 96% functionality rate, which is about 10 to 15% above average. 
does WAVE use a definition of functionality that is consistent with the government of Uganda's definition? Thanks, Ella. I was almost hoping someone would, would ask that question so I could expand on this a bit. We, we have two ways of monitoring functionality. That functionality figure that I gave is our spot functionality, where we have an independent monitor that we contract to go around to each source once per quarter to do a source survey. And so that 96% is, it's, it's a bit of a proxy indicator because that only tells you if water was coming out of that source at the time the monitor visited it. So it doesn't tell you if that source was broken for one day or five days or 20 days. Our complementary monitoring system is where we have the, the community and our field officers and the mechanics report any breakdown and then we track each breakdown duration. So we're also able to calculate a reliability figure in the same way that Rob talked about how any source should be down for less than three days under a preventive maintenance model. We use a very similar approach. And so we're also able to quantify those reliability calculations. But the simplest metric and part of the reason that we use it when we report our KPIs back to government is because spot functionality is the most clearly understood. Whereas when we say things like reliability, then we have to add in more definition of what we mean by that, how many days was it broken, what constitutes an acceptable level of reliability, and, and so on. So our target really is that breakdown duration of, of two days or two, three days or less. And, uh, and then that spot functionality is a slightly more crude proxy indicator, but one that's clearly understood. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, Duncan. Um, for Rob this time, sustainability seems like a core focus of the pre preventative maintenance approach. Uh, what proxy measures are you using to predict sustainability within the areas that are receiving preventative maintenance services? And how confident are you in these? Right, nice question, Ella. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, our goal within the program around sustainability is linked in to the government's constitutional goal to get um, universal supplies to everybody. So um, there are intermediate approaches within that work to try and get coverage um, as high as possible and to look at different institutional, operational and financial factors within that. So institutionally, I think we're trying to get the right policies and strategies into place. And this is part of the SWS program as well to work with government trying to co-design them as we go forward, which we've had some engagement at the national level, which is encouraging. And we're in that conversation there. So you've got the right legal and policy architecture in place um, that has a legacy effect because we should not be there for the long term. Um, then on the operational side, what sort of what sort of models are appropriate? I mean, like Duncan, we're learning as we go and we're learning a lot in this process of what um, type of model would be appropriate, what level of um, what sort of level of financial performance is required within that. And that requires um, wider stakeholder engagement with other partners to to reduce the cost of that. And that is an ongoing um, conversation. So I don't I don't know some of those numbers quite um, quite as we stand at the moment. Another thing from the financial side, which is a key area for us, um, as for everybody, it's it's trying to reduce the costs um, to have the you know the least cost most effective solution, um, which is an iterative program of work. Um, but this relates into finding new and in my view domestic sources of finance. And one of the major sustainability indicators for me is the proportion of the finance that's covered by users, by government and domestic finance, not by donors, not by external partners. Um, and we're having some success in one of our study sites having companies invest in the program through these indicators which are partly determined that we have good monitoring systems. So we have, we have an automated system which costs money, but that leads to um, corporate partners having more trust that you're not gaming the system, that people are telling you results that you want to hear, which I think is an enduring challenge. So that's an interesting space that we're looking at and where we will advance partly with uh, this USA collaboration. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Rob. Uh, we have a lot more questions uh, here, but unfortunately, we've come to the end of the hour for a webinar. So what we will do is 
We've kept track of the questions that you have and we'll relay them to the presenters and I will work with them uh, to try and answer them uh, to the best extent possible. Uh, these are really important questions and it's really good for us as we, as we move forward with this partnership. So thank you both uh, to the speakers. Thank you to the participants for, for staying tuned. Uh, all, of, all of you are still um, on board with us. So this is great. Uh, and we hope to provide you with more updates on not just the SWS Learning Partnership, but also what USAID uh, is doing in the space. Uh, and lastly, I do want to thank the people that are behind the scenes. Dan's been sitting next to me, feeding me the questions. So thank you. Uh, the Chief of Party, Eddie Perez, also in front of me, and Tim, uh, the Water CKM team, Brittany, who have really been involved in making sure that, that we have this, this webinar well organized. And, and to Pranav, who's at the University of Colorado Boulder, for, for doing some background lit review on the topic. Uh, thank you all for, for all the great work. Uh, and see you next time. Thanks.